meio-dia né, a todos. É, a gente está começando o evento, é, o mini evento do, é, do KDE, aqui no, é, no Fisley. O evento se chama é, Engrenagem. Então a gente começa com a palestra do David, que é, é, colaborador, é colaborador do KDE, ele mora em Londres. É, e depois, a partir das duas horas da, ta, é, da tarde, a gente tem uma série de outras palestras sobre o KDE que vão acontecer na sala 41F. Tá? É, se vocês tiverem perguntas, é, vocês podem fazer pelo aplicativo do Fisley ou também é, ao final da palestra. Tá? É só levantar a mão. Vocês podem perguntar em português, a gente traduz para ele. Tá? É, so, switching to uh, English. This uh, year uh, we have the pleasure of having David, uh, uh, David Edmundson joining uh, us in FISO 17. David is one of the lead developers of Plasma Team and a long-term KDE contributor. He's going to talk about Plasma 5, Infinite and beyond. Okay, so David, thank you. Thank you very much. Apparently, we have a tradition of inviting a random KDE European to experience the Brazilian summer weather. It's not as sunny as I hoped. <laughs> Is it good? Okay, cool. So I want to talk about not where we are with Plasma at the moment, but with our goals and where we're going, not just Plasma 5.8, Plasma 5.9, and all the way into the future over the next three or four years. Proximo. So I've been hacking on KDE for the past uh, 10 years, which is probably when these slide templates date from. I'm from England, and as Sandro pointed out, I'm lead developer of Plasma, and I'm employed by Blue Systems, who make a wonderful distribution, Netrunner Linux. Does anyone use Netrunner Linux? Nope, that's encouraging. It's going well. It means I'll be employed for longer to make it more popular. Next. So in this talk, I'll cover the goals of Plasma, what we're trying to achieve with Plasma, our strengths, why it's the best, and why a sky behind the screen should switch away from GNOME, and the upcoming challenges, where we're going in the future over the next three or four years, what are going to be the biggest challenges that we face in Plasma. Next. So what's the point of a desktop computer? Why do you even turn it on in the morning? And the reason is because you want to get some work done. You want to paint a picture, or you want to fill in your tax return, or do some programming. And that's really why we have computers. It's to, next, run your applications. My subtle way of changing slides. Anyway, to run your applications. And that's why we have computers. So if we look at Windows, it looks like this. OS X, next, looks like this. Linux, Linux is rubbish on its own. Not a very popular thing to say, but on its own, Linux doesn't do anything. It gives you a black screen. And next, GNU slash Linux, not much better. And that's unusable. You can't use this on its own. Next. So where does Plasma fit in? Next. Plasma's goal is to provide everything that goes from a black screen to being able to run your applications, to being able to get stuff done. Because that's why you turn your computer on, to get stuff done. You need something to get to your applications. Next. So yeah, it's everything between a black screen and your applications. It's a middleware in between, but it's fairly boring. Next. So what's the goal of a Plasma desktop? We know your goal is to get your applications, but breaking us down, next. You sit in front of your computer for eight hours a day, most of us. We wake up, we turn on the computer, all day you're doing this. So it's important to be as productive as possible. So our goal as Plasma is to get you to your applications, to try and get you uh, as quickly as possible so you can start doing your work. We wanted to make it easy so you can configure your hardware, so you're not wasting your time when you should be working, when you should be getting stuff done, trying to make your mouse work or make your screens work. All of that should be handled for you, and that's our job. And we want to be able to be there to set up your workflow. We don't decide what your workflow is. 
we help you create your workflow and provide the tools around it. Next. So our goal, putting it in three words, is to help you get stuff done. Next. So why is Plasma the best tool for getting stuff done? This is an advert. Next. It's very, very customizable. And customizable is spelled with an S because I'm a proper English speaker. Next. So this is our standard desktop. And it looks familiar. And familiar is good. It doesn't mean we're copying. It means people have expectations of what they want from a desktop, what they want to get things done. And we don't want to make people learn something new. But with a few clicks, you can make Plasma look like this, or this, or this monstrosity, if that's what you're into. It's very, very easy to customize just your look and feel and your shape and how things are laid out. And that's not just about playing around. It's about matching your productivity, because you're going to have a completely different way of working to this guy, to that person. Everyone's got their own unique flow, and we need, want to be able to provide the tools for you to work quickest. So, don't know where that was. Okay. So we provide multiple workflows. I mean, in just a way to launch an application, because launching an application is probably one of the most important things you do to launch and switch between applications. We have a text-based interface. We have a Windows-like start menu, which sort of cascades. We have a single. This is working quite efficiently. Where we have. Our new menu, which was copied from something OpenSUSE did 10 years ago, where everything stays within the same dialog. It's quite easy to find everything. And that's our default menu. But we even have a full screen launcher, if that's, if that's what suits you best. And it's very easy just to switch between all of the different alternative modules we have. It's very much a Lego-based operating system, as we like to call it. You can just right click on any widget and say what other alternative widgets are there which provide the same functionality. So with a single click on your clock, you can choose between four different other types of clock for the one that you find most convenient to your way you work. So it's very, very easy to customize your setup. And we have this design philosophy across our widgets that they should be simple by default but powerful when needed. And if you look across all of our default widgets, you see this. Our network management applet, for example, it's very, very, very easy to connect to a network. But if you need to configure a VPN with an SSH tunnel, it's possible. Because we don't want to limit the tools to find you can't do your work, but we still want to provide it so it's easy for you to do everything. So that's our design philosophy and our goals that we're seeing across Plasma. But it's much more than just fancy graphical widgets. You've got parts of Plasma, everything that takes you from that black screen to your applications is your network management, your sound management, your power management, your clipboard management, your window management. There's so much behind the scenes, there's 20 or so different background demons, things to tell you when you're low on disk space. All of these different things happen behind the scenes, and it's quite a big piece of software. And if we break this down, we see about a quarter of Plasma is the graphical user interface side. A quarter of it is managing your windows and drawing your windows on the screen, because obviously that's quite important. And the remaining quarter is all of the settings and all of the hardware management that goes alongside Plasma and goes alongside having a running desktop. So we have this one of the greatest strengths in Plasma is we're based on really, really old code that's been evolved over the years, very much an evolutionary piece of software. So over the last 20 years, we've been working on this. So this piece of software alone, system settings, is around 60,000 lines of code, which is 12 man years of development, just for all of the different configuration options, your daemons, and all the things that happen in the background to make a desktop work. So it's a lot of development which always trumped up new desktop environments, don't really match. So again, I said this was an advert. And we're built on 
the latest technology. Even though we have this legacy code base that we've evolved over time, we're using new features. The entire graphical side is all OpenGL powered. So it's running on low hardware. We're making use of your graphic card, sending your CPU to sleep wherever possible. And it's fast. Ars Technica said it was considerably snappier than its predecessor. And the other thing that Plasma provides, which we don't see in other desktop environments, is integrating your data from your applications back into your shell. So be it instant messaging, emails, or a calendar we've brought back. Because again, this all goes back to optimizing your workflow. Because if your boss comes over and says, can you go to this conference on Tuesday? You don't want to have to load all your applications. You should have it there as quickly as possible. So again, everything comes down to your workflow. But one of our other greatest strengths is we're not as narrow-minded only focusing on KDE software should work in KDE stack. I mean, this piece of software, LibreOffice, quite famous. It looks and blends in exactly the same as all your other KDE applications on your Plasma desktop. And you probably can't even tell which toolkit it is. I can't remember which one's GTK2, which one's GTK3. But it's both going on here. And we make everything blend in just as well as it would if it was a native application. So that's Plasma. That's the goals of Plasma. That's where we're... That's where we're heading, that's our direction. But the important part is looking into your future. Where are we going a year from now, two years from now, three years from now? What are, what are your big problems? And that's going to be me in the future, hopefully. So the big trend at the moment, the thing everyone's talking about, is sandboxed applications. We see Snappy coming from Ubuntu side. We've got Flatpak coming from Fedora. And a sandbox application is an application that has very, very limited privileges on your system. So if you download an application, which is a painting application, it shouldn't have the powers to destroy all your files. It shouldn't have the powers to sniff your, act as a keylogger or get your bank details. And we're seeing with Android and stuff, users expect this level of security in a system. And sandbox applications sounds like it shouldn't affect us, it uh, affects applications. Unfortunately, we have lots of work to do. Security is the important part here. The applications are secure. And that means we need to be secure. We can't rely on assumptions that we used to rely on. Previously, if a desktop application was running, it's got access to everything, at which point we don't need to try and limit it. It's already got access to your files. It's already got access to every other window. But now we're, we're acting as a police. It's Plasma's responsibility to act as the Wayland compositor, telling which applications the information they need and only information they need, and to make sure the applications can't talk to each other. But sometimes applications need to talk to each other. And it's and we load plugins into our window manager. And if you can manipulate your window manager, then the entire security of Wayland is utterly pointless. And it's something that we've been writing our software not really worrying about. I mean, we're secure from remote attacks, but we've never had to care about can applications on our system manipulate applications on our own system. But now we do have to worry about that. So it's a huge challenge that we need to revisit all of our code, and make sure it's secure. And we have problems with how sandboxing is going to affect applications. If we consider a typical media player, it's got these keys on your keyboard, which skip track, pause music. And currently, the way it works is exactly the same way to a keylogger works. And we want media players to work, keys to work. We do not want keyloggers to work. So Plasma is, acts as the role of sending the keys to the application. Plasma needs to act as, again, the police of working out whether a media player can get these keys but not be a keylogger. And we have mechanisms for that, but it's a whole new challenge. And we also have our media players put on these on-screen displays to tell you, 
oh, this is a new track, you're listening to this new track, and I'm going to put a big window in front of all your other windows. And that's a nice feature. We want that feature to exist. But it's very bad to let applications put windows wherever they want, because then they could just put windows in front of Firefox. So when you visit your bank, you're not really visiting your bank, or show pop-ups in your face all of the time. And if we have sandboxed applications, we can't allow that. So we have a problem between what we expect from the previous applications and sandboxing stopping these things working. So the only way to solve this is to integrate all of these features that applications abuse themselves into a shell. And for media players, we have that. We have that solved. We saw in that last slide. We can integrate a media player already using existing specifications. But screen capture is not going to work in Wayland in a way which is safe. So does that become the responsibility of your shell? Is it now Plasma's job to do screen capturing in a way that's safe? Skype puts up a little notification when you get a call in the middle of the screen. That's important, but Skype won't be allowed to put a uh, window in the middle of the screen. So Plasma's going to need to have some new notification system for urgent notifications and drawing things to the middle of the screen, if needed, in a way which is secure. And it's a big challenge because we have these two conflicting goals. Applications doing useful things and stopping applications doing dangerous things. And unfortunately, to Plasma, they look the same. So a lot more features are going to have to move into your shell. There's an application called Redshift people like to install, which changes the gamma of your monitor. That's not going to work. So in order to have that same feature, Plasma needs to start doing this. And we're seeing this across multiple, multiple processes and features. So Plasma's going to have to get bigger to cope with the sandbox applications. So hopefully we'll see new standards coming across the desktop or the whole sandbox thing will fall apart and not catch on. Hopefully we'll see new standards. The other main thing that's changing, the big change that's coming over the last few years and is going to continue into the future, is form factors are changing. My laptop, I can touch a screen, and instead of just getting a dirty screen, it now acts as key presses. I can expect an on-screen keyboard to work. I can fold the screen around so I can't access the keyboard. At which point, all of our fundamental things that we relied on, like having a mouse, having a keyboard, having a warm screen, which is of a certain resolution, all of these assumptions start to fail. And that's been a huge problem already, and it's going to continue to be a big problem over the next few years. So last year, we started a project which you may have heard about, Plasma Mobile. Has anyone heard of Plasma Mobile? One person. Yeah, two. That's twice as many as I hoped. And the reason we did Plasma Mobile, which was taking our entire shell, taking everything we did, and shoving it on a phone. And a phone is a very, very, very different form factor to a desktop PC with your mouse and keyboard. It's a complete opposite extreme. And the reason we did that is because if we can make something work on a mobile phone and on a big desktop, then implicitly, we fix every kind of device that's in between. We fix a desktop computer which has a touch screen, we fix a laptop which has a touch screen, and we're sort of working our way into a tablet area. So even though Plasma Mobile is sort of an experiment, I don't think you're going to see it on your shelf in the next five years if you go to Vodafone. But it's still important because it's forcing us to address these problems now so that we can start fixing them now, ready for when the desktop starts evolving. And it works. I should have brought one with me. It's a perfectly usable phone. It can make phone calls. Can't do SMS, but who uses that anymore? And you can run applications. But then we have this other problem of uh, do our application scale to a touch interface? And 
that leads us to our probably biggest problem we have in plasma right now and again evolving over the next few years is we have a shift in the type of toolkit we're using. We're used to using Q widgets, so it's a standard, very desktop-y way of writing software. There's no fancy acceleration. Everything's it's been working for 20 years or so on developing this desktop way of writing software. And we're starting to find we're reaching the limits of this. As far as Qt's concerned, it's on support. They're not accepting any new features. And it's not really going anywhere. It works, it's brilliant, but it's not going anywhere. And on the other hand, we have our Qt Quick interfaces based on Qt Quick controls. And this is all OpenGL powered. It's all declaratively written. And it was all originally designed by, in the Nokia days, the BlackBerry days, for mobile interfaces. You can write something here and have it work on Android. And one of the greatest features of uh, KD applications was you write it once, you run it on Windows and OS X. But now we're seeing people writing applications and they want to run it on Android and iOS because they're yeah, just as big a market. If anything, they're bigger markets. So we have this shift between these two different toolkits. And that's a problem because now we have two different technologies in the same space. And in Plasma, we use both. And they look the same, and no one can tell the difference, hopefully. But that's shifting. We have this conflict between the direction we want to take and consistency. You can't use two toolkits and have it look the same, or can you? And this is a gallery from a new library called Kirigami. And the point of Kirigami was to expand on Qt controls and provide the modern interfaces you'd expect from a modern application, be it either your web or some of your common platforms on Android, where you have the sidebars and list views and dragging things, which is a common pattern now, but wasn't a common pattern when we started writing our software. So we have this dilemma. We have the Qt controls, which are mobile friendly. They're animation friendly. People like the smooth animations or material design, to use buzzwords. And it's easy to integrate into these very rich, dynamic applications that don't look boring and dated. But we have a queue widget, which is very stable. Queue quick controls is not stable. It's changing again next year, and we need to update all of our code. We know it works. It's got amazing keyboard interaction because it's been designed for our whole mouse and keyboard setup. And we have all of these existing themes that work with it. And if we m migrate to a new toolkit, all of these existing themes aren't going to work, and that's going to cause upset among our users. So currently, we're using Qt Quick Controls, and it has problems. We can see it has problems. I can list tons of bugs. So we have to try and integrate these two schemes, and that's our problem that we're having over the next few years. But when we get our new designs from our visual design group, and we're getting lots of new designs, and we're currently saying, well, we can't really implement that without transitioning to a new toolkit. And we have some amazing new designs coming from our design team. So, oh, near end quite quickly, sorry. Okay, Plasma is in a good state. We are one of the top three desktops. Hopefully, in my opinion, the best. Hopefully, I've swayed some of you to go back and try it and realize this is what we're trying to achieve. That actually suits me. Try it, customize it, find it is making you more productive because at the end of the day, that's what matters. It's still very relevant. As Linux desktop usage is as relevant as it was two years ago. People are still using it. People are still spending as much time there. But it's still something that's still evolving. The desktop side's not dead. It's continuing to evolve, but we're seeing it evolve in all of these new ways. And hopefully, I've summed up some of the things we're seeing in the future. So, does anyone have any questions?
you can switch to your magical app. Have I convinced you to change, Mr. Person behind the screen? He's considering it. I can see him installing Kubuntu right now. That's why a screen's blank. David, two questions, please. Uh, the first one, uh, at the beginning, Plasma had the goal of being a very flexible framework for creating a UX application. So we could have Plasma running on my fridge or in my car GPS. And uh, it seems that lately has, uh, it has deviated a little bit from, from that goal. I uh, do we still uh, want to pursue that? I think you're right. That Things have, we used to have a plasma media center. That was a big thing where we were taking a plasma stuff and saying, okay, if we take your software, can we convert it to run on a TV? Because some of your problems are the same. If you're writing software for a TV, you don't want to rewrite how to connect to a network. You don't want to rewrite even screen management because that's a boring part. So we were approaching almost industries. I spoke at KubeCon about what Plasma offered, and we were talking to these companies saying, well, you've got your single-use device. You don't want to have to spend your time doing network management and sound management. You want to spend your time writing a piece of software you're writing. And Plasma is a suitable device for that. It's either Android or Plasma. And we haven't seen as much adoption with that as maybe we would have hoped, but Plasma Mobile is changing that. We're seeing Plasma is a whole, um, we spent a lot of time making Plasma work on a Raspberry Pi and these low level devices because that's what we're seeing in the embedded industry. So it has been some feedback, some of it positive. And I think, I think we're seeing Plasma split a bit. So instead of just running entire shell, you would just pick the components you need and run it on a different device because a few years ago, people were of the opinion that phones are getting smarter, your phone will do everything. But I think there's now a shift towards computers are getting cheaper, soon you'll have a computer for everything. My, my TV has a computer in it now. And a few years ago, that would have seemed ridiculous. But now, for $20, I can buy a computer I put in the back of a TV. And we're seeing that everywhere, I think. I don't think Plasma will shift, but we'll see Plasma put on these different platforms. Uh, the second question is, um, when should we expect Kirigami running on top of Qt Quick Controls 2? Good question. So, in theory, it will be a very, very simple port and nothing will break. So, uh, one thing I should have mentioned about Kirigami is our new, it's a set of extra widgets on top of the default uh, Qt Quick Controls, which Qt are providing to write your applications on everywhere. And we're seeing our libraries get used by a subsurface, um, an application for logging your scuba dives, but it's written by Linus Torvald, which is why it's famous. They're using Kirigami, and they've ported it to Android and iOS, and it's being used in the real world. And they're using a Plasma theme, I believe. So some of these Plasma components, a few small sections of it, are already being used. As for when it will be ported to Qt Controls 2, probably three months will start in three months because it becomes stable in Qt 5.7. The next Plasma release will still be using Qt 5.6. After that, we'll be upgrading to Qt 5.7. So that's when we'll start looking at it. And then we'll probably find bugs and then have to wait for the next Qt release before it's usable. 
Yeah, well, n not just me, but um, yes, I, I, I'm employed, I'm actually now employed full time to work on Plasma, so it's become a living hell. Yeah. Mais, eh, mais perguntas? Não? Uh, David, you listed three possible futures for the study box in applications. <laughs> yes, I did. yes, but uh, what uh, is your feeling? Uh, which will be the, the future? Any? Do you know if how the the other desktop uh, communities are addressing that those problems? Well, what's interesting is the backers behind the two different sandboxing platforms also have a preferred desktop environment. So, I mean, Fedora's, it's not Fedora doesn't run Flatpak, it's an open community project, but they're funding some of the development. And if they're funding some of the development, some of the needs are going to match GNOME's need. Because, again, GNOME is an open community project, but it's known that Fedora pushes it. Snappy on the other side, hand. Again, it's an open community project, but a lot of the funding comes from Ubuntu and Canonical, they have a preferred desktop environment. It's not Plasma. So that's going to be interesting. Both of them have reached out to KDE. I've spoken to Flatpak people and I've spoken to Snappy people, and they have been very welcoming. So I don't want to sound negative. But as to whether they'll catch on, it's, it depends because if only a few applications are sandboxed, that doesn't really accomplish anything because you either sandbox everything or it's just as insecure. Because if you're still downloading random things off the internet, then the application which was already safe, you want LibreOffice we can probably trust, sandboxing it doesn't really have a huge advantage. It's the random applications from the internet that you want to sandbox. And unless it becomes ubiquitous, as in everybody is sandboxing, then it's going to be a complete waste of time. So we'll see. I'm, I'm hopeful, but skeptical. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, let's thank David for his uh, his talk.